A warm welcome to Finland. My name is Auslöj and I will moderate the first part of the seminar, the part that is streamed. Hopefully the automatic translation on YouTube in the down right corner is working. After lunch, Kaisa Kepsu from the Nordic Welfare Center will moderate the panel discussion. We will start with short introductions and hello from the Nordic institutions and Iceland, followed by four speakers giving, each giving a 15-minute talk on today's topic, topic and time for Q and A. We will take a short coffee break uh, at around 10.30 for 15 minutes and lunch starts at 11.45. Thank you all for participating today from all over the Nordics and the Baltics with the majority present here in Helsinki. The topic equal opportunities of children of foreign origin with developmental disorders in the Nordics pushes us to examine what the situation looks like in the aftermath of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We are here to share knowledge and learn from each other by identifying, or if that is too strong of a word, marking what are the biggest challenges we face, what types of services seem to be most successful for different groups? What uh, can service providers working with immigrant families learn from each other to guarantee equal opportunities for all children? I hope we will learn something from each other today that is beneficial to you all that bring grace and guidance to the life of uh, so many. Now I would like to give uh, the word to our hosts here in Helsinki, Henrik Oeman, Senior Communication Advisor at the Nordic Culture Point, followed by Kaisa Kepsu, Senior Advisor from the Nordic Welfare Center. But they made it possible for this seminar to become a reality. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, welcome to Nordic Culture Point, uh, which is the, the place where you are right now, you in the audience. Uh, just this is like more of a word from the sponsor of how to speak, <laughs> just so you, you a little bit about our organization. Uh, we're called Nordic Culture Point, uh, Nordisk Kulturkontakt in Scandinavian, and uh, uh, work under the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, so, uh, which comprises of all the five Nordic countries, and then uh, Greenland, Faroe Islands, and, and uh, Åland. And uh, we are an official Nordic cultural institution, which means our, my highest boss uh, are, are the, the five prime ministers of the Nordic countries, uh, uh, if you want to put it that way. So, uh, so financed by, by all the Nordic states. And uh, we are based here in Helsinki, but we have some activities over all, the, all of the Nordic region. And there are a few other institutions like ours, uh, which are placed mostly in these kind of border areas of the Nordic region, if you want to say, put it that way, or places where the Scandinavian languages maybe aren't that strong. So there are no inst cultural institutions in Denmark, Norway, or Sweden, but uh, we are here in Helsinki. There is one on Åland. Uh, in the Nordic House in Reykjavik, I'm sure, is very uh, familiar to all of you. It's, it's the first one of them, uh, the oldest one, and uh, uh, a lot bigger than than us, and has a quite quite a lot quite a bigger role, I think, in 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 Iceland than we have here in Finland as well. And same is the case with the Faroe Islands, where where the the Nordic House is the biggest cultural producer in the whole of the country. So. So in these places, these institutions, I'm sure, have a, have a really big importance as well. Uh, and then, yeah, I could add, these are the cultural institutions. Then there are uh, 
about 10 more institutions that are specialized in different areas. For example, Nordic Welfare Center that we, you will hear more about in just a little bit from Kaisa. So, but we are all like uh, institutions that try to implement what the Nordic Council of Ministers uh, decide. And uh, yeah, our task is to strengthen and promote Nordic cooperation in the field of culture and art. So usually there are people uh, more involved with culture and art sitting in this uh, in this uh, room, but but we try to cooperate a lot with our Nordic colleagues as well. So this is a great opportunity for us to have some new people in here as well. Uh, and but this actually is something one of the reasons why we thought that we actually could uh, provide this space and and are happy to to work with you today because in our vision is for that uh, that for everybody to have equal opportunities to participate in society and cultural life. So I think that goes very well with, with what you will talk about today. Culture is maybe a small part of what you will be talking about as well. And um, yes, learning, diversity, accessibility. Uh, then I think I'll, I'll skip a few slides here, not to go in too much into detail, but our main areas of that, that we work with is, is, is grant programs. We, we give out money to cultural projects in all of the Nordic region. So there are applications sent in from all over the Nordics and then we administer these programs and uh, about five million euros every year is, is uh, uh, granted to, to these cultural corporations. So that is our main task. And then we also have a Nordic library here on the other side of the corridor. Maybe you'll have the time to, to just check it out during the lunch break, maybe. Uh, it's quite similar to the one in the Nordic house in Iceland, you could say, with literature in all the Nordic languages. And then a lot of events, uh, smaller and bigger. <coughs> there are groups from schools coming here, from kindergartens, and then we have uh, a lot of public events and also seminars like this one. So, uh, yeah, last year, 200 events. So, quite a lot of that as well. And, uh, yeah, and as I mentioned, a lot of activities for, for children, uh, mainly school groups. And some numbers. Ah. <laughs> we'll skip them. But, yeah, please, uh, if you're interested in what we do, please follow us on, on Facebook. That is a really good place to, to uh, get to know what we do. Uh, and, or in Instagram also, and, and the web, web page is there. So if there's anything you you want to know more about, you can check it out on the internet. Thanks, and uh, have a great day here in Helsinki. Thanks, Henrik and Aslaug. So on behalf of uh, the Nordic uh, Welfare Center, uh, I also want to wish you very warmly welcome here uh, physically in Helsinki and also for the people who are following us online. Uh, so I am Kaisa Kepsu and uh, I, um, I manage a project um, in integration um, uh, under the Nordic Welfare Center. And um, I will be moderating the second part, um, the panel discussion, which will not be streamed, but for you guys here <laughs> present. And uh, during this um, morning, I will run around with the mic when uh, after the presentation. So, so be free to discuss uh, our our topics today. So we believe in the Nordic Council of Ministers that there is a lot to learn from. Uh, each other, the Nordic countries, uh, and cooperate in solving current challenges in our societies. So that's why we exist, and that's why the big bosses, our uh, prime ministers and our governments, think this is a good idea to have uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers. The Nordic Welfare Center, we work in the social and health sector, um, and it's a fruitful um, field because our welfare systems share a lot of similarities and uh, therefore there are a lot of opportunities for exchange of experiences. So our main task is to contribute to uh, the development of welfare systems and initiatives in the Nordic region and, and uh, support the, uh, the national uh, initiatives. 
as a knowledge-based organization. Um, we do that by compiling and disseminating knowledge, different types of knowledge, uh, for example, research, <coughs> uh, and also promote the exchange of knowledge, like today. And um, our main target groups include uh, government officials, um, regional and local authorities, decision makers, uh, researchers, um, and so on. So as we want to engage in, in current um, challenges, the <coughs> growing number of children uh, from foreign uh, backgrounds with developmental disorders are, are uh, one that needs special attention. And uh, <coughs> at Nordic Welfare Center, we work closely um, uh, with disability issues. Um, my colleague uh, um, Gunnar in Stockholm is coordinating that work. And um, me, myself, I work in the co cooperation program on particular issues uh, regarding integration of refugees and, and uh, uh, immigrants. And um, it all links to the vision of the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, we have this vision for 2030 to be the most sustainable and integrated region in the world. And we work with social sustain sustainability uh, in, in issues that uh, an inclusive society where everybody can have uh, equal opportunities and, and be engaged in uh, and active members of society. So my project with uh, integration, um, we cooperate closely with our sister organization, one more of these institutions of the Nordic Council of Ministers, Nordregio, in Stockholm, where my colleague Helena Lagerkant uh, pulls the strings in, in Stockholm. And um, if you want to want know more about the work that we do, I encourage you to visit our website, integrationnorden.org or nordicwelfare.org. And of course, I want to thank you for being here uh, and uh, the Nordic Culture Point uh, for, for being the host and Oslo uh, for a great cooperation. And um, I'm really glad to be able to be a part of this. And um, today, let's hope that we really can uh, be inspired and share, share ideas and experiences and discuss uh, our common challenges. So have a good day, and, and I'll leave the floor now to Aslo. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you, Kaisa. I would like to introduce Inkolvur Einarsson, pediatrician at the Counseling and Diagnostic Center in Iceland. The center is a national institution serving children and adolescents from birth to 18 years of age and their families. Their mission is to ensure that children and adolescents with de developmental disorders require diagnosis and counseling and have access to resources to improve quality of life. Inkolvur will share a light on developments in Iceland in connection with growing number of children of foreign background that need diagnosis as well as overall changes within legislations, legis legislations for children as well and uh, as aims to improve services. So you're very well welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Asla and Kaisa, for welcoming us today. And I will uh, give uh, a short introduction of uh, our center and, uh, and uh, uh, some changes for the legislation for in, 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 in on behalf of children in, in Iceland. So it will be a quick um, introduction. And then I will show a, a video, an example of one video that our team ha has done recently. So this is Iceland. Uh, uh, we are a small population, but uh, we are all 
many of living as around the capital, Reykjavik capital area, two thirds of the population live there, uh, and uh, a smaller population is scattered around the around the coast of Iceland. The center is difficult, a hard place to live, ice, ice and uh, cold. Um, our center is uh, CDC, I call it CDC, uh, Counseling Diagnostic Center, is uh, just outside Reykjavik, and we serve the whole, the whole country. Uh, I always um, imagine that Sweden was the biggest of the Nordic countries, but uh, as you can see here, Norway is actually the biggest in, in surface, and, and uh, we are quite small, and Denmark is even smaller. But um, uh, population-wise, we are the smallest, uh, uh, a very small uh, proportion of the population in the Nordic region. Sweden has the largest population, and then Denmark, Finland, and Norway, about 20% each. So, very small population we have. Uh, we would have a little bit higher population if we, if we didn't have um, um, all the natural disasters, the cold and the disease epidemics, and people are actually moving out of Iceland, the massive uh, movement of Icelanders in the end of 19th century. Um, and they have actually done an interesting um, uh, investigation that we might be over a million if, uh, if these uh, incidents didn't happen. <laughs> but actually we are only been slowing, slowly increasing in numbers for the last century or so. So that might be the reason for the small population of uh, our country. Um, but we are in, uh, increasing in numbers, and uh, the, 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 most, the highest reason for this is the um, immigration, people moving to our country, which is a good thing, um, and uh, it has increased for the last 20 years, gradually, and it, uh, we are thought to be uh, a, a, a 15, 15, oh, just over 15% of our population is thought to be of uh, foreign or origin or immigrants, uh, uh, and this um, includes the first and second uh, generation. The light blue uh, um, is the indicator of uh, one parent being foreign. So uh, the highest number of, of uh, our immigrants are coming from Poland. The, the, they are by, by far the highest, uh, 20,000 or more. Uh, and the next uh, population coming from Lithuania, just over 3,000. So it's a, the, the Polish uh, community is, is a very high proportion of our immigrants. And uh, it is scattered around the country, but the uh, more, uh, more highest proportion of immigrants is living in the southwest, uh, in the Keplavik area. Uh, and that's where the, our international airport is and the, the gateway to our our country for the world. So that might be the reason for this, uh, but also we had a NATO base there that uh, they were used to having an um, uh, American army that uh, they are actually using some of the houses they left uh, for uh, our immigrants to live. So that might be the reason for this high proportion in this area. And then the westwards is fa fairly high and that um, um, the fishing industry work opportunities is, is the reason behind this. So we are scattered around the country. Um, this uh, report, rather nice, uh, very thorough report from 2019, uh, shows how the uh, uh, comparison between the Nordic countries uh, really, really is. The highest number of immigrants is, has been coming to Sweden um, um, uh, by far, and they have had some uh, challenges um, re regarding this number. But uh, if we compare these uh, numbers uh, related to the number of inhabitants in each country, uh, we have um, uh, received the highest number of immigrants for the last few years. And that is actually causing our system um, uh, difficult, our system service systems is having difficulties in coping with the, these uh, uh, lot of uh, immigrants coming over a very short period of time. So the municipalities and the, they are now kind of uh, want to reduce the numbers coming to their area. So uh, that's a that's a huge challenge. Uh, we uh, at our center we have had uh, children uh, refer to us 
uh, uh, and um, one of the reasons might be um, uh, this study might show that one of the reasons behind this. Uh, uh, I just wanted to show you this. Uh, it's a new study, uh, uh, and this slide is in Icelandic, but. Um, uh, the main results and conclusion from this study uh, um, where they uh, examined um, 25, it's a rather small group, but 25 children with foreign background, bilingual background, uh, speaking uh, at home their mother language and in, in preschool the Icelandic. And they were all born in Iceland, so they're second generation uh, immigrants. Uh, and they lacked, uh, were significantly behind uh, uh, their Icelandic peers in, in, in uh, the language standardized tests uh, they, they had performed. But uh, the language samples, they were, uh, they came, uh, was uh, better. So the standardized tests uh, are, uh, are make, making the difference more obvious uh, between this group and the Icelandic native group. And uh, this might lead to overdiagnosis of of uh, of uh, uh, this group of children uh, reg regarding their verbal competence, and we actually are coming by this uh, this uh, tendency in our clinical work, and many of the children referred to our center um, might have been picked up by this uh, these uh, tests and. Uh, and uh, may be uh, overdiagnosed, with, overdiagnosed with developmental impairment, uh, but they actually are not uh, uh, with so much uh, problem. But this emphasizes that we should do better with, uh, with the, the intervention for the, the whole group uh, as well. So, um, if if I just change over to this new legislation Ausl uh, referred to um, in Iceland, uh, uh, it was um, um, uh, agreed by the Parliament last year and should take uh, uh, action from the beginning, beginning of this year. And the implementation is uh, is supposed to be uh, for the next uh, three to five uh, years, and the aim is to um, um, improve. Uh, service in general for children, all children in Iceland. Um, it's uh, um, supposed to uh, take down the walls between the service providers and try to integrate uh, the whole ser the, the service for all children. And um, uh, and uh, uh, all the uh, service providers should uh, work uh, more closely together. And uh, we are just starting um, to uh, implement uh, this legislation. Uh, um, and this is actually the, the Prime Minister uh, who is very uh, interested and is, is very eager to improve service for, for all children in Iceland, especially children with, uh, with uh, sensitive uh, social uh, um, environment. Uh, but al also other other groups that we are talking about today and uh, groups with uh, disabilities. So we are part of these changes and uh, actually our uh, institute went from the uh, Ministry of Social Affairs to the to the sorry <laughs> to the uh, Ministry of uh, of um, Education and Children. Along with him, he moved uh, his the minister moved himself and took uh, some of the uh, institution service children with him. So um, um, the, um, the service providers should um, kind of uh, re restructure and rethink uh, their, their role in the system. And uh, for the first time in the Icelandic legislation, we have the, this, the service level staged. So the first level is supposed to be in general for the whole a children population uh, and the, the local service uh, should be well organized and then we should have the the second and the third states also very well organized and uh, all the providers uh, should think about where they fit in uh, with the service so uh, they don't put any center or any 
institute in this uh, uh, pyra pyramid, but we should find our role within it and, and work uh, in more deep, deeply together. So um, I think it, it's a good um, uh, kind of structure to build our service better. Uh, we would think that um, our center would be in the third uh, level, and so I put we put our uh, name up there. But uh, we we are sometimes also serving on the on the second and sometimes on the primary level, and cooperating with people at, at all levels. So. Um, uh, we have heard a little bit about our center. I'm not going to repeat it. It will, it will come out in the video. I uh, will show you later on. Our main disability groups uh, are here on this slide. The, the, the largest group is uh, our uh, children at, this, at the preschool age with the suspicion of autism spectrum disorders. So this has uh, increased for the last uh, few years a lot. Um, uh, as uh, in, in other Nordic countries, I believe. Um, but we other ha also have other important groups uh, uh, as well that uh, we um, uh, will not for forget. A um, uh, mixture of autism spectrum disorder and intellectual developmental disorders is the, the, the uh, most uh, common group. So we use the frame of uh, reference um, uh, according to international classification of diseases. It's the tenth edition still. I don't know if you. Uh, it will be interesting to hear if you have started to use the eleventh uh, edition uh, regarding the diagnosis of disabilities. But we have been trying to move in the direction of international international classification of functioning as well. Uh, to kind of go in the direction of participation and and um, and um, uh, the child well-being in 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 their surrounding. Uh, so it's um, client-centered, family-centered uh, center, um, and we collaborate a lot with the parents and encourage them to encourage them to take active participation uh, regarding the uh, their child. So this is the uh, a curve showing you how how, how our uh, immigrant uh, population has increased as uh, as uh, uh, re in the reference group we have to our center. Uh, so um, above thirty percent of uh, children referred last year had a foreign background, both the uh, immigrant first ge first generation and uh, and second. Uh, generation, and the highest number of them com coming from from Poland, as before, as expected, uh, and uh, from other many other countries as well. For last year, forty-two other countries. So it's a it's a good var variety from the world. So um, uh, uh, with this increase uh, amount of our uh, our users with uh, foreign background, uh, the uh, we have started to kind of focus on this group how we can do better, and with the with the help from uh, a funding from the government, uh, we had a working uh, team uh, w looking close more closely into what how we can improve our our care for these children, and actually they found many points to uh, to improve. Uh, uh, and uh, we are kind of working on th on those uh, issues. We need to explain better what the assessment means, what what it what it involves, and uh, why we are doing it. We need to do uh, more and better follow up interviews uh, for these families. Um, we need to um, uh, explain better our our terms. What uh, the terms in Icelandic for the diagnosis uh, for the conditions that might lead to disability, and the term disability itself, we we have to ex explain a lot, uh, quite a lot, and um, and uh, and why we are doing it. We are doing it uh, to help. We are doing it to uh, uh, try to get the children to have the right uh, uh, and early intervention um, as as possible. So um, 
uh, we use interpreters uh, very much uh, f with our families and uh, it, it is very important that they and uh, to our work and understanding between us and the interpreters is, is quite clear. So we have come across that we need to improve this, um, this uh, cooperation and understanding of, of interpreters. Uh, and um, we have had some uh, um, group work with them, but we need to do, do more. Uh, we don't have so many interpreters for some of the languages, so that's a, that's a challenge for us. Um, and uh, we have not uh, gone into habit of using um, uh, distance uh, uh, translations uh, uh, so much. Uh, the team has uh, done some support group sessions with uh, uh, people, families, uh, parents coming from similar cultural areas to explain better our, um, uh, uh, our system and how it works. So, uh, to, to um, um, increase this knowledge, the team uh, has produced three, three videos up until now, very nice videos, and published them in uh, Icelandic English and Polish. And we, we wanted to show you one example uh, of the, those videos. Um, and uh, we have one, if we could have one of them running now. Um, this is Julia. She lives with her family in Iceland. Julia's parents and teachers have noticed signs that she might be developing differently. Their first step is to seek advice from a specialist in their municipality, through a school or healthcare center for preliminary examination of the child's development and skills. If the results of the assessment indicate that there is a reason for further examination, the child will be referred to the counseling and diagnostic center. The role of the Counseling and Diagnostic Center is, among other things, to ensure that children with severe developmental disabilities that can lead to disability later in life receive diagnosis, counseling, and other resources that will improve their quality of life. A team of specialists at the center work with children like Yulia from all over the country up to the age of 18. When there is concern of disorders like autism, developmental disabilities and or physical disabilities, the specialists at the Counseling and Diagnostic Centre are there to assist and offer support. The next step for Yulia is to visit the Counseling and Diagnostic Centre and meet experts who form an interdisciplinary team for the child. The team evaluates her history and current behaviour with the help of parents and teachers. The team interacts with the child and standardised exams are completed. This process gives the team a well-rounded perspective on how Yulia functions in her daily life. This information is then compiled to see if she meets any diagnostic criteria. The results and corresponding resources are reviewed with her parents. Children diagnosed with disabilities are entitled to assistance by law on services for disabled people with long-term support needs. Services for the disabled are provided by the social and school services of the municipality. Parents are also entitled to child care benefits from the Social Insurance Administration due to increased expenses in connection with the child's disability. In some cases, Icelandic Health Insurance participates in the payment for aid, training and travel expenses. For more information about the centre, visit www.rgr.is. So, uh, that was the... Uh a sample, the, the voice of First Lady of Iceland, she, she read the text and the team uh, produced the uh, manuscript. Quite nice and, and uh, clear, clearly explained. Well done. So, um, um, if I just come to the la my last slide, um, uh, concluding that we, we need to do much better. It's a continuation of work and, uh, and uh, the group of immigrants Coming to our country is, is, is and our the Nordic countries is increasing. So um, we also need to um, improve ourselves in understanding uh, the background of the people coming to our country, the needs and the, the their difficult. Well, they have some of them had have difficult life before coming to the country. So uh, we need to understand their perspective and uh, we need to explain our system. So thank you. And
Any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Ingolver. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the insight and uh, the situation and share a light on how it is in Iceland. Uh, next speaker is uh, one of the four speakers uh, today after Ingolver, that uh, is a chief physician at the New Children's Hospital in Finland, Anne Sarajuri, who works at the daycare center Vori. And the center provides care and performs diagnostic examinations for children who have an autistic spectrum disorder or other neurological difficulties. Anne will introduce a research result uh, in an article that is subject to come out in a Finnish medical journal uh, soon about the rising figure of developmental issues among children with foreign background, with focus on autism spectrum disorders. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the <laughs> So I'm a pediatric neurologist and I work at the Helsinki University Central Hospital and uh, in child neurology, neuro neurology department and at the moment at the day centre Buori, um, which is a pediatric neurologic day centre specialised in the diagnosis and treatment of autism spectrum disorders and also of, of, uh, and of, of, of uh, small children and also of other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders when the child cannot be assessed polyclinically. Uh, children older than six years uh, in, at our hospital area are referred to uh, the division of child psychiatry if they don't have also suspicion of intellectual disability. And we serve the area of uh, Helsinki University Central Hospital, hospital area of about 1.7 million inhabitants. And at the moment we have had about 250 new referrals to our unit uh, uh, last year with an increasing trend. Here you see the referrals since 2014. But we had a change of organization then and we used to consist of three uh, smaller day centers uh, and one of them was removed to uh, child psychiatry division. So we continued with two. So these figures after 2014 are not comparable but we see an increasing trend uh, since 2015 and then it was a little bit going down and then going up again and this year seems that we have at least enough uh, at least as much patients as uh, new patients as last year okay and we have also noticed an increasing amount of our patients coming from uh, immigrant families and a doctor called Miljami Jolma, who unfortunately could not herself be here as she works nowadays in Lahti. Uh, Lahti Hospital, about 100 kilometers from here. Um, and as she was doing her specialization uh, at our unit, uh, she did a study uh, where she went through the patient records of all the patients at our day center during one year and the, they were aged three to six years. She collected information regarding the diagnosis, age and growth, pregnancy and delivery data, country of origin of the parents. There was more, more uh, information found about the, or more often uh, information found about the mother's origin, so she based it on the, the, those results. Uh, and she was, uh, according to the mother's countries of origin, she grouped uh, the patients into six areas where their mothers came from and compared the amount of children at our unit to the whole amount of uh, children of the same age living in the hospital area whose mothers came from the same unit. So she, uh, and these uh, statistics came from the Tilastokeskus, which name is here is in English, I won't, don't want to read it, it's so long, but <laughs> terrible name for an institution in English. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, yes, then she accounted the risk for separate areas of the world uh, uh, for the children of this age to end up at our unit and compared it to the risk of uh, those with uh, Finnish origin mothers and counted the relative risk for being assessed at our unit due to either autism spectrum disorder with or without developmental delay and due to other diagnoses. And this uh, uh, publication has, uh, these uh, results have been accepted for publication and as is, it, it has not yet been published, so I will only uh, give a short glimpse of the main results and then discuss some questions behind these findings or some possible reasons. So this is uh, the patient uh, numbers. Uh, altogether, there were 455 uh, kids assessed during that year at our unit, and only 22% of those uh, had a Finnish mother. And when we go through more detail uh, according to diagnosis, so about two-thirds had autism spectrum disorder, and in that group, uh, the Finnish mothers were only in 16% of patients. Uh, less than half of those compared to uh, other diagnosis group. And if we go into further detail, very many of the autistic children also had global developmental delay, and here the amount of Finnish mothers is even less. Here you can see the countries of origin of our pa parents. Uh, so they come from quite many places all over the world, almost from 75 countries and 78 languages were spoken. But most of the children were still born in Finland. And they had really different backgrounds. I mean, some already, some parents already have arrived in Finland as a child and, and some are refugees coming the last year. And some are also highly educated work in the IT branch, for example, so very different kind of backgrounds. Okay, so here shortly the risk ratios according to the country of origin or area of origin of the mother. Uh, I only present the most alarming data here, so um, uh, the risk ratio was highest among patients with autism and developmental delay, uh, and when uh, the mother came from Northern Africa or Middle East, Middle East re uh, region, the risk ratio was more than 50, and also when she came from sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. Uh, in other uh, uh, parts of Asia, it was also clearly increased, 34. Uh, the other areas, practically Europe and America, they also have increased risk, but not as much as these areas. But for non-autistic patients, uh, the risk was also increased, but not at all as highly as for <coughs> autistic patients. There are also earlier studies about increased risk of autism among immigrants. Uh, the earliest may be from, from Sweden, or in 1987, they found an increased risk of autism uh, among ch uh, children with foreign origin but the risk ratio was 7.3, so clearly less than in our, our patient sample. Also, similar increased risk was, was found in Great Britain among children with Caribbean background, and in Holland an increased risk uh, for severe autism among children with African background, but clearly lower risk. Um, in the USA also, they have noticed that when mo moving towards north, the incidence of severe autism increases. In Finland, there has been an earlier register study on children born between 87 and 2005, and there, there the increased risk for uh, immigrant mothers was uh, much lower than what we see nowadays at our unit. In warmer countries like California and Australia, there is no increased risk for autism in immigrant population. Yes, um, from many countries uh, where our patients come from, there is information about the incidence uh, or the prevalence um, of autism, and it's not higher 
than in other countries. Of course, in many countries we don't have exact data. But it seems that it cannot be explained by genetic factors. There must be some environmental factors, at least as well, that affect the risk. And when we think of the reasons, we have to think what causes autism. And we know that in many cases it's multifactorial. So both genetic factors and environmental factors uh, are that are interacting with each other. About the genetics, we know that there are more than 2,000 genes that increase the risk of autism, most of them to a small extent, but some have a bigger, bigger effect. There are many environmental factors, mainly related to the time before birth and also birth-related, for example, increase in age of parents and pregnancy complications like diabetes, also lack of D vitamin <coughs> or the mystic or folic acid, and also birth-related complications. <coughs> About D vitamin deficiency, there, there is earlier data uh, how if it affects the risk of autism uh, if there is deficiency during pregnancy. And there are two quite recent <coughs> meta-analyses which both show increased risk. So the first one uh, by Wang last year showed that uh, low maternal D vitamin level during pregnancy is related to increased risk of autism among the child. But the odds ratio was 2.7, so the risk is it cannot uh, explain all the risk of our patients as it is not in the same amount. Uh, the other uh, meta-analysts ha had similar, very similar result, but they just reported uh, to the other way around so that the highest maternal D vitamin level category during pregnancy was uh, compared with the lowest category was related to a lower risk of autism in, the in a child. And they also noticed um, that the largest associations were between uh, autism and vitamin levels in the very uh, in the e early and mid gestation. Then there is also a Finnish biobank study. Uh, it's a registry-based case control study, including all live-born children between 87 and 2004, and they had biobank samples taken during the pregnancy that were measured for the level of D vitamin. They also found a significant association between maternal D vitamin levels and uh, so high, higher maternal D vitamin levels and lower risk of autism. But here also, uh, uh, to take it the other way around, the risk is about 2.3 or something, so much less than our, our increased risk. Uh, and this study was done before we had the um, um, uh, national recommendation for using D vitamin supplement during pregnancy. Uh, some uh, data supporting uh, the idea of the effect of, uh, uh, of uh, deficiency with D vitamin um, to the risk of autism, we can see from a seasonal variation from a birth. Uh, of children with autism. In earlier studies in Finland and Sweden, a tendency of more autistic children born at the end of the year, when the early pregnancy has been during the winter time, has been reported, but not in Australia. Uh, and here you can see from our study, uh, here on the right hand side, can I have pointed to see here? Uh, here, um, the normal uh, Finnish children, um, sorry, born in the same area. So this is, uh, here you see the uh, months. So um, they are quite evenly born all, all the time of the year. But uh, this is from Miriam's study in this population. Also, you can see that uh, there are more autistic uh, children born at the end of the year, so the pregnancy begins during winter time when D vitamin levels are lower. So how common is then D vitamin deficiency among immigrant adults in Finland? There is some, some data on that, quite, quite recent data also, and uh, this uh, immigrant group has been, have been examined on that, and it was very common among Somalis, 80 
0.5 percentage, and then from people uh, among people coming from Kurdistan even higher than that, and severe deficiency almost in half of them. Among Russians also, there's much more commonly vitamin D deficiency compared to the Finnish people. What could be the reason for the deficiency? So the production of vitamin D in the skin with help of sunlight is a major source. And then also milk products enriched with vitamin D make a large portion of the intake of, of vitamin D among Finns. But many immigrants maybe don't use so much milk products as we do here in Finland. Also eating fish is a good source of vitamin D and uh, among some immigrant groups it's not maybe eaten so much. Uh, here just quickly to show uh, some pictures about the ultraviolet light index. But here is um, Helsinki and here are some areas for where I, uh, our patients come from so we can see that there is much more sun in many other places of the world than here. So there are some possible mechanisms that could explain the effect of maternal lack of vitamin D during pregnancy on the risk of autism. Uh, the deficiency increases uh, many pregnancy complications like um, gestation diabetes and intrauterine growth retardation, preeclampsia and prematurity, and all these are known risk factors for autism. Also, it may increase the risk of maternal infections and immune system disturbances and the prevalence of autoimmune diseases. And it's also known that for the development of uh, central nervous system, D vitamin is also very crucial. But as maybe D vitamin <laughs> cannot explain it all, maybe we have to think of other possible environmental factors as well. Uh, and there is also uh, recent research on these issues, and uh, they have been they have found some <coughs> some asso associations of different environmental toxins and pollutants with with autism. But if there whether or not there really is a causal relationship is not known very well. Um, one interesting thing that there's. Uh, one interesting example about the interaction between genes and environment it is that there is, for, for example, a gene no, uh, named PON1, and its gene variants make a person more sensitive to the effects of organophosphates, and it's also a known, uh, known um, gene affecting the risk of autism. Then about heavy metals, there is a meta-analysis of the lead and mercury levels in the hair samples of autistic patients <coughs> which were higher compared to controls in developing countries but not in developed countries. So I think this is also one very interesting question as the people come from, many, many, many of our patients come from developing countries, what kind of uh, circumstances they have been there and, and also even their mothers uh, if the child is born born uh, in Finland, are there some things that could could affect the child still uh, due to mother's exposure to some some toxic agents? And when I read these subjects, I came up with this kind of um, guidelines for the prevention of childhood lead toxicity by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it shows what uh, kind of measures there have been in the USA to lower the levels of uh, blood lead, lead among kids. And as you see here is the blue line is the mean uh, blood lead level among kids. It ha has gone down a lot uh, due to these measures. And nowadays uh, the level of five micrograms per de deciliter is the present safe level, of what is thought to be safe about the effects on lead on children. It decreases the cognitive skills, increases the risk of ADHD, increases antisocial behavior, and also spontaneous abortions, and the risk of small gestational weight, and can also affect postnatal growth negatively. Uh, here, just one picture about how they have measured that even though the, say, oops, sorry, safe, 
safe line is here, they have measured that also below that limit lead uh, can lead to IQ loss. And as the number of children is very big here, they counted that even the, if the IQ loss is not so big um, regarding one child, but the estimated IQ points loss is for the whole group is very big. Here, I don't go through this in detail, but there are many sources of lead still nowadays. Um, and pains with lead are, for example, still not forbidden in many developing countries. And also in the USA, they have discovered about 10 years ago that in the housings, 35% of the housings still have lead pains. And it's thought to be the important source for children that they put things in their mouth. Um, and what happens to the lead in the body? When it, it arrives the body through different ways, it gets to, uh, through the bloodstream. Uh, it's also stored in red blood cells. It goes to the kidneys, bones and to the brain. And it's stored in the bones where the half-life can be even 20 to 30 years. During pregnancy and lactation, the lead can be released uh, from the bony storage into the circulation and it crosses the placenta and it's harmful for the developing central nervous system and no safe limit can be given. Then I also noticed this uh, report about uh, the blood levels in low-income and middle-income countries, the systematic review in the planet, uh, Lancet Planetary Health. Um, and here you can see the mean blood levels among children in some countries. So they were, these were the highest, highest levels, mean levels. And you can see here that when five was considered to be about the safe, some sort of safe limit. So in these countries, the mean levels is even about that. So there are lots of children who have too high levels of fleet in the blood. Actually, they counted also the amount of children, and it was something like four different countries, and it was something like hundreds of millions altogether. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one, one interesting question, how much this can affect the developmental problems also among our patients. Okay, to conclude, Developmental disorders in our hospital are more common among children with foreign background and especially the abundance of autism spectrum disorders with developmental delay among children of immigrant mothers is alarming. The reason may be multifactorial and this different combination of genetic and environmental factors may, may act together and, and different com combinations of different individuals. Uh, lack of D vitamin and also folic acid are known risk factors and we don't know whether or not rec the recommended doses for pregnancies is enough for all mothers. Lead is also one possible factor that can cause global developmental delay. Of course, there are many other factors may that I didn't mention and I even don't know, but definitely we need to do more research on this. And the increased risk of immigrant mothers for having a child with autism is a humanitarian strategy and needs to be examined in more detail. I'm sorry if I took a bit too much time, but <laughs> maybe there is time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an interesting uh, insight and we might have time for one or two questions so now is your chance yeah or comments yes thank you very much it's been really interesting my name is Anna Laura and I come from the National Association of Intellectual Disabilities um, so I'm not a practitioner, like I'm a human rights, uh, you know, I, I work for human rights. I'm just wondering, you know, maybe this is specially for you, you know, how can interest organizations step into this um, field and how can we assist in, 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 you know, turning this to a, to a better place? 
That is a very good question. Yes, <laughs> and I think we will return to that a little bit later yeah. when we discuss the challenges in a bit. Yeah. If do you yeah. have any comments? Yes. Yes. I think, uh, for example, also at, at our place, I think that um, yes, one question is, is of course what I'm very concerned is how how to uh, find out the reason for this and help people uh, to maybe have more knowledge about the risk factors and so. And one question is, of course in other ways how to support the families of, as of course they are mainly very often without any families here and they don't have any support so so that is also one big issue on how, how to handle with these special need t kids if you don't have so much support from your families who are on the other side of the world. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? Before we go to the next speaker, lots to think about at least and very much uh, information we got and so thank you and I know you are very busy, you are going yeah, straight can, back to work. I can listen some of the yes. next time. Yes, wonderful, <laughs> thank, you thank you very, very much. <laughs> so. Uh, now, uh, second speaker, guest speaker is Anna Mari Paavonen, a researcher at Kela. Kela means in Icelandic to make out. <laughs> Kanta Kela. Uh, but Kela is the social insurance institution of Finland. And uh, Anna Mari will introduce the background on her and Tuija Partanen's research on rehabilitation of children, adolescents, and families with immigrant background and main findings. So you are very welcome here. So good morning on my behalf as well, and welcome to Helsinki to you all. As it was introduced, my name is Anna-Maria Paavonen and I work as a researcher at the Social Insurance Institution of Finland, which in Finnish we call Kela, as you, as you heard. <laughs> and in Finland, Kela is one of the biggest organizations that arranges rehabilitation services. And we also have a research department where we do research, for example, on rehabilitation services. And my topic for today is children, adolescents and families with an immigrant background participating in rehabilitation and more specifically the challenges healthcare professionals and rehabilitation providers have encountered in the rehabilitation process when the rehabilitation service is arranged by Kela. And this presentation is based on a study we conducted together with my colleague Tuja Partanen last winter. But let me first show you the contents of my presentation. So first I'm going to tell you about the, the background of our study. Then I'm going to go through the data and methods of our study and then the results of our study. And finally, I'm going to summarize our main findings. So the results of the study have been published in this working paper. You can see on the slide, but unfortunately it is in Finnish. But during this presentation, I'm going to go through the main findings we got. So, let, let me first tell you about the background of our study. So, in the Finnish studies, it has been found that individuals with an immigrant background use less mental health and rehabilitation services compared to the population as a whole. And in other countries, Challenges in pediatric rehabilitation, when the customers have been children and families with an immigrant background, the challenges have been related to, for example, language and communication issues, divergent understandings of disability, and socio-structural barriers, which in this case have been, for example, the complexity of the service system or the limited available time during the therapy sessions. And in the Finnish service system, Kela has a legal obligation to arrange vocational rehabilitation, intensive medical rehabilitation and rehabilitative psychotherapy to all persons under, uh, insured under the 
Health Insurance Act. And when it comes to children and adolescents, they most, and most often participate in individual therapies arranged as intensive medical rehabilitation. And these individual therapies can be, for example, speech therapy, occupational therapy and physiotherapy. And if you would like to know more about the services Kela arranges, here is some, some websites you can find more information on and about the application process, for example. And as a background, for our study, I'm going to show you a, a simplified version of the referral process when it comes to the individual therapies arranged by Kela. So first of all, the, the rehabilitation needs in this case of a child needs to be identified, for example, in daycare or at home or in child health clinics. And then the rehabilitation needs of the child needs to be assessed by a doctor in the public healthcare system and a rehabilitation plan needs to be written for the child. Then, in this case, the family needs to apply for the rehabilitation from Kela. So they need to fill in the application form and send it to Kela. And, and, this, and in this phase, the family already usually needs to know the, the name of the therapist, so they have chosen the service provider. And also they would need to uh, state the starting date of the the therapy in the, in the application form. And then based on the, the application, Gela makes a, a decision on the rehabilitation service and sends a written decision to the, fa to the family and to the therapist. And then after the family has received the, the uh, decision, they need to contact the therapist and arrange the first therapy session. And after this, the actual service begins. <clears throat> and when it comes to our study, our aims were to investigate what kind of rehabilitation services arranged by Kela children and adolescents with an immigrant background participate in, and what kind of challenges the healthcare professional and the rehabilitation providers have encountered in the rehabilitation process when the customers have been children, adolescents and families with an immigrant background. And during this, this presentation, I'm going to focus on the second question, so the challenges the professional have encountered. So, let me then, then show you the data and methods of our study. So, you can see here that, first of all, we had two questionnaires for the rehabilitation providers which in this case were most often speech therapists, uh, physiotherapists or occupational therapists. And these questionnaires we used were part of uh, two other research or development projects that were previously carried out in Kela. And also for this study, we conducted some focus group and individual interviews. And there as informants, we also had rehabilitation providers, professional working in healthcare and professionals working at non-governmental organizations. And as data, we also had positive rehabilitation decisions that had been made to children and adolescents with an immigrant background. But during this presentation, I'm going to focus on the qualitative uh, data and the findings we made based on that. So. Let me now show you the findings we made. So, based on the qualitative data analysis, 16 sub-themes were created, which were further categorized to four main themes. And the four, th four main themes we found were customer with an immigrant background navigating the Finnish service system, preparation of the rehabilitation process, seamless rehabilitation process for the customer, and issues with interpretation. And on this slide you can see all the four main themes and the 16 sub-themes under them. And next I'm going to go through the, all the 16 sub-themes and the main findings we made considering them. But on this slide I would only like to show you that as you can see the, the first uh, main theme and the 
three sub-themes under it are framed, and this is because based on the based on our da data, it could be suggested that the these themes could partly explain the the contents of the other 13 sub-themes. So the challenges, uh, so the other challenges that had occurred in the rehabilitation process. But now, let's see what was our first uh, main theme. So this main theme was named uh, Customer with an Immigrant Background Navigating the Finnish Service System. And on the upper right side of the slide you can see the sub-themes we are going through, so you can follow how many themes there are still left to be presented. So the first challenge under this main theme was that the families often do not have enough knowledge on rehabilitation and, it, and its goals in the Finnish service system when they participate the the actual rehabilitation service. So they don't know, for example, what is the role of the therapist or the parents during the uh, rehabilitation process. Also, the families do not do not know enough of the Finnish social and healthcare system. For example, what kind of services there is available and how to access them. Uh, then it was noted that that the families often have some simultaneous needs for support when they participate in the rehabilitation services. So they might ask the therapist for help to, for example, apply for benefits or arrange daycare for their children. And the therapists have been happy to help the families, but, but these questions and needs for support have taken time away from the actual therapeutic work during the therapy sessions. And then it was noted that the families might have also some more general needs for support, for example, managing their everyday life when they have a, ch a child in the family with special needs. So the the goals of the individual therapy can become too wide and they can't be met with only individual therapy. So the families could benefit, for example, support, for example, family services. And then our next day theme uh, was called uh, preparation phase or the preparation of the rehabilitation process. And this theme considers uh, this theme considers all the challenges that occurred uh, before the actual rehabilitation service uh, had begun. So first of all, there's been delays, uh, possibly delays in the referral to the rehabilitation. For example, when the child has difficulties in, in linguistic development. Also, it was noted that the services might fail to reach these customers. Uh, for example, when the rehabilitation needs of these children and adolescents are considering mental health issues. Uh, then the families have needed help in the application process. So for example, in filling in the application form. So it has been often the social workers working in healthcare who has helped the families to fill in the, the application form. And then the families have had challenges in finding a therapist for, for the rehabilitation. So here it has also been the healthcare professionals who, ha who have usually find the therapist for the family. And also it was noted that some of the therapists might hesitate to use an interpreter during the therapy sessions. So this might also make it more, more difficult for these families to find a therapist. And then, uh, lastly, arranging the first therapy session, that has been also a challenge for the families. So here it has also been the, the therapist who has uh, contacted the family so that the rehabilitation service can begin. And then our next theme was called a seamless rehabilitation process for the customer. And here we have gathered all the challenges that had occurred during the actual service participation. So first of all, there's been challenges in the starting phase of the rehabilitation service. So the first discussions on the practical arrangements uh, during the rehabilitation process has taken more time. 
and also during during the individual therapies, the therapist might visit the, the child's daycare or school and they have needed to explain the Finnish daycare and school system for the families so that the families would understand uh, what kind of uh, support or, or what kind of uh, 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 support yeah, the, the therapists are maybe uh, giving the children in the in the school or in in, uh, in the daycare. And then there's been challenges in the goal setting process, so the families do not always know what is their role in the goal setting process. And also building the therapeutic relationship that has, that has taken more time, for example, building trust between the therapist and the family. And then uh, there's been challenges also including the rehabilitation to the everyday life of the families. So during the individual therapies, the therapist might also visit the, the family's home, that they could find ways to support the child at home as well. So the, the families do not always know why the therapist would like to visit their home during the rehabilitation process. Also, it was described that the families might have uh, different kinds of habits of playing and reading with their children, so this might affect the amount uh, the families uh, might support the, the children at home, for example, in, in their linguistic development. And then lastly, uh, managing the rehabilitation process. There's been challenges. So, for example, in the flow of information between the family, the therapist and the healthcare. So the families do not always know that it could be their role to inform, for example, th to inform, for example, the therapist that the, they are having follow-up visits in healthcare, for example. And then our last main theme was called interpretation, and here are all the challenges that I could that had occurred uh, considering issues with interpretation. So first of all, there hasn't been enough, av uh, enough interpreters available. For example, when the language the family talks is a smaller one, then the therapist uh, described that they might not always trust the interpreters' professional skills, so, so they have wondered, for example, if the interpreters know enough about rehabilitation or whether their Finnish skills are good enough so that the family could understand correctly what is happening during the rehabilitation process. Then the therapists describe that the families do not always trust the interpreters, and this has also been in the cases where the where the language the family talks is a smaller one, or if the family knows the interpreter already beforehand. And lastly, it was noted that interpretation all in all takes more time away from the actual therapeutic work during the therapy sessions. So, here was our main findings and the themes we found based on our data. So next I'm going to summarize our main findings. So uh, based on our data, compared to the population as a whole, the actual therapeutic work during the individual therapies, that do not differ when the customers are children and adolescents with an immigrant background. But the challenges in the rehabilitation process are related to the preparation phase, to the seamless rehabilitation process for the customer, and to issues with interpretation. So there might be possible delays in, in the referral, and the services might fail to reach these children and adolescents. Also, the goal-setting process and building a therapeutic relationship has taken more time, and issues with interpretation might challenge the communication and, and need less time for therapeutic work during the therapy sessions. And based on our data, we suggested that Gela and social and healthcare organizations could provide more support for the families, for example, in the application process. 
and Kela should offer also more information on the support services it provides uh, for the rehabilitation process. So there is, for example, uh, information on rehabilitation in different languages on the Kela website. Also, therapists and interpreters should be provided more training, for example, on interpretation during rehabilitation and more collaboration between social and healthcare organizations is needed so that the rehabilitation needs of these children and adolescents are identified more efficiently and so that the family's other simultaneous service needs are better met. And on this final slide, you can see the, uh, uh, all of our main findings and in the different phases of the referral process you, you saw in the, in the first slides. And you can also see that the phenomena that might have caused these challenges have been issues with uh, or language difficulties, then divergent understandings of, understandings of disability, knowledge on rehabilitation and on the Finnish service system and the simultaneous needs for support these families have had. And I've also gathered here some literature on the topic. Uh, if you would like to read more about this in English, these are some of the papers we found uh, when we did the background section for our paper. So we did a little little literature review. So here were the kind of the most important references we had in our paper. So thank you. And if you have any questions, please contact us. <laughs> In. I just want to say that all of you have been, who have signed up for this event will be sent these slides uh, after, afterwards to your emails that you have given. If you haven't, you can come up to me and, and uh, send your email. Yes, do you yes. have any questions? And we have some time for questions now. <coughs> just a, uh, thank you so much. It's yes. so interesting. And I see so many similarities between oh, yes. Sweden and um, Finland and mm -hmm. Iceland. And, but what I would like to ask is um, what, what type of therapy um, do they is provided to the to the families? You, you know, you mm -hmm. talked about a therapeutic relationship and therapy. That's mm. just the question. Yeah, in this yeah. study, the 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 uh, therapies the families have had was uh, speech therapy or occupational therapy, physiotherapy. So those kind of individual therapies. Yeah. yeah. More questions? We have some time before coffee break. So please. Or comments. Or comments, thoughts. Something that Do you yes. have similar challenges? Mm. Yes, thank you. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering if the uh, your the therapists that are under your system mm -hmm. are they uh, do they have different kind of service providing or do you is the their work paid directly by the state of Finland? Mm -hmm. Is it the whole Finland? Uh, yeah, the therapist. Yes. Yeah, in in the the uh, uh, rehabilitation arranged by Kela, there is uh, these uh, individual therapists that have uh, made a contract with Kela. Uh -huh. So there's a list of therapists that the families can choose from. Uh -huh. So those are kind of the service providers, and they're like and then Kela Kela is uh, funding the yeah. funding the service. So yeah. and does the family pay some amount or? Uh, no, it's or? it's yeah. These therapists are free of charge for the families. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Anna Laura. I'm just wondering um, if there is any collaboration between uh, those who work on immigration, mm -hmm. because like I come from Iceland, mm -hmm. and it seems to be very little collaboration. I mean, people, yeah. oh, everyone wants to do well, mm -hmm. but those who work with people with disabilities, oh. they don't know very much about immigration. Yes. And those who work with on immigration, they don't know mm -hmm. much very much about disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, what is the situation in Finland? I mean, mm -hmm. is there like a a formal link or collaboration between mm. these two areas. Yeah, well, I think we, um, for example, have a uh, association which deals with 
uh, immigrants with disabilities. And in our study, it was found that these families, or, or maybe it, was, it, it, it has usually been adults with disabilities who have asked for help from this association, for example. And I think we might have a speaker from this association later today, I think. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we have. <laughs> so, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, other questions, thoughts? I think you raised a really good point here that the collaboration is, is really important and I think we will get back to that as well in the panel discussion. So I think we can take a break now. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a short 15 minutes break now. We will start again at quarter to uh, 11. Finish time. So 15 minutes break. See you soon.
Seems we have lost. Welcome back. Our next speaker is Thomas Barrow, Associate Professor in Education at the University of Gothenburg at the Department of Education and Special Education. But Thomas will, on the 1st of October, change universities to Örebro University School of Humanities, Education and Social uh, Sciences as a professor in special education. He will give us an insight into Swedish schools in connection with children and youth with intellectual disabilities, developments and experiences. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. Inviting me. Good morning, everybody. My name is Thomas Bauer. I'm, as you said, an associate professor in education and it's an honor to have my, I think it will be my last presentation for the University of Gothenburg, actually. Yes, my topic is children and youth with intellectual disability in Swedish schools, developments and experiences over time. And actually, uh, I think, I hope at least I will bring a diff little bit different focus in this discussion because uh, I have my background in education and in more specific in uh, special education. Uh, and not in medicine or rehabilitation sciences or uh, uh, our areas or our disciplines. Um, actually, I feel very honored to be invited here. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk give a talk abroad, but uh, uh, you may expect uh, a lot of clarity in my talk, but I feel when I pre uh, prepared this presentation, I became more and more confused, and I hope that you will understand my <laughs> confusion. Uh, so that is already uh, the aim, so to, so to say, to understand my confusion about it. I will try to map the field, how it's looking like in Sweden right now. I cannot come like, uh, uh, like Anna-Marie uh, before me uh, with a with one study and, and, and uh, methods and results and, and uh, conclusions and so on. So I will try more to give an overview about the situation in Sweden. Um, yes, you see the structure of my talk. I start with a short introduction, then I will have a very, how to say, a general approach, but focusing on education, but of course I also would like to take up some other issues. I will start with start students with intellectual disabilities in special schools, and then uh, the next step, students with intellectual disability and migration background in special schools. And finally, very briefly, I will present a Swedish study on migration and intellectual dis disability. And then, well, I, I would, I think it's hardly appropriate to use the word conclusions, but I call it preliminary conclusions in this field. Yeah, my introduction. Um, you can see here a newspaper article from the Swedish newspaper Svenska Dagbladet. Uh, we interviewed my colleague and friend Daniel Östlund, a professor at, in special education at Christiansted University, and they took up in this in this article the increase of number uh, of pupils in special school, the Swedish, you may know the Swedish word Särskola or Grundsärskola when it comes to the primary level and, and uh, it's said here in, in English that the, the title more and more children are placed in special school. It is unclear why. So um, uh, that is uh, an issue we are discussing in Sweden. I wrote here a hot topic but with a question mark as you uh, certainly know, we have uh, a lot of political issues in Sweden right now. We have no government and, and it will take probably some time to get in your government. So this is a, a certainly a topic in Sweden, but, but uh, I have my doubts if you should really call, call it a hot topic. It's somehow in the media, but it's not so the main issue right now. Um, and uh, I will go in into these numbers a little bit later on. Um, oi, that was not my idea, sorry. That looks better. Uh, I think one thing we have to consider when we discuss 
discuss all these issues is that we have uh, different disciplines and we have also varying disability definitions. What does it mean, intellectual disability, or when we use the Swedish term, utvecklingsstörning, what, or it's also changing right now, this term, we have, we'll have new terms in, in, in some months, but, but uh, what does it really mean and how do, you, do we define? So, and, and when it comes to, this, uh, to education, we have a Swedish uh, education law, and there it's simply said children who are judged not to be able to meet the primary school's knowledge requirements because we have a dual developmental disability, Utwecklingsstörning, must be accepted in special school. And uh, uh, the basis for, for this judgment, for this assessment, is in the educational, psychological, medical and social assessment report. So it's a combination of different uh, disciplines and uh, uh, it would be very much very interesting to discuss more in detail, perhaps we will do it later on in the panel discussion today, uh, uh, how the different uh, disciplines or how the different professionals in the field cooperate in this field. Uh, but when we take it more from a, from a, a perspective on public health, there uh, we have registers, a ba a register based the Stockholm Youth Cohort, where they take, took all the uh, how to say, the, the whole population of, of a greater Stockholm area. And there the basis is the uh, different uh, uh, assessment manuals that you can see here in my, uh, uh, on my slide. Yes, how does it look with students with uh, intellectual disability in special schools? And here I would like to show you um, a development over time. You can see here uh, the time from 1994 uh, to uh, 2021. So the latest numbers will come, I think, about in two weeks or so, but uh, it is at least until last year's development. And what you can see here is the number of students in different teaching settings. You have the highest uh, line up there, this curve in blue, is the total number of students registers in special schools. And what is very interesting to see is that there's uh, quite, quite a variation over time. We had in the mid-90s, we had uh, about 1% of children in special schools, but then there was an increase up to about 1.4% around 2004 or so. And uh, then there has been some changes also in the assessment processes and there was a decrease. There has been a number of school reforms also. We had then for a number of years, about between 2013 and 2018, uh, uh, more or less stable 1% of children in special schools. And we have now again such an increase that about 1.3% of the children uh, with intellectual disabilities are in special schools. Uh, schools. So, um, and, and it's very interesting to, 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 to think about what are the reasons behind these uh, developments. Um, and, and uh, for example, in the 90s we have had a big school reform, we have had a communalization of schools, that the municipality was a, a, a main shareholder of this. And then we had uh, the situation that um, uh, there has been reforms within the school system, so that might have influenced the tendency to uh, uh, to diagnose children and to send them to different types of schools. Uh, in this, uh, on this slide, you can see well at the top the number of total of the total number of students registered in special schools. Then below, in light blue, you see the student numbers in special schools. Um, what we call, we have two part, two, two different, uh, how to say, uh, sections of this school. We have a, the Grundskirchsel school and we have a training school. school. So, and, and in this school, in this train, so-called training school, we have children with more severe uh, disabilities, so not only this intellectual disability, very often also combined with other types of uh, disability, Physical, dis more physical motoric disability or whatever, uh, and um, so in the in the 
so-called Grundsehrschule. We see also it's about the same development like like in the in the total uh, population in this school, and we have also a slight increase when it comes to this dark red number. So in the training scholar, we also have a, a slight increase of pupils in the recent years, and and below uh, this, I think it's orange. This, this line, you can see the uh, number of students that are registered in special schools, but they get minimum of 50% teaching in compulsory schools so in, or in primary school. So um, we have, according to Swedish law, the opportunity that these children can be, we use the, word, the term integrated uh, in, in, re in regular school. So about something like 16% or so of these children from special schools are integrated, and you see this number is more or less stable during the last uh, well, 20, oh, yes, 25 years. Um, what is very interesting to see, the development within the school, when you s are, and these are the latest numbers, when you are in this Grundsehrschule, so, so the, the, the bigger part of this special school, you can see that there is a very interesting development. In grade one, there are only, all over Sweden, there are only about 580 children that get education from the beginning in this special school. But then, if you look in, in uh, grade nine, there are, these are these red numbers there, 1,262 uh, Pupils, so about doubled. So, and if you see these red numbers, you see it's a continuous increase from year to year. So something hap is happening in uh, in primary school. It's not so that they uh, are diagnosed in an in an early age, let's say age of four or five or six or so, and then start in special school. It's something what is happening, obviously happening when we attend school and uh, uh, so that they end up in this uh, Grundsehrschule. What is also uh, interesting to know, you see these green numbers up there. We have um, an over-representation -represent of boys in, uh, in these special schools. Uh, I think that is very much in line with international developments and very much in line with uh, also, if I see the historical development, in Sweden, I think these numbers are stable for, I don't know, about 150 years or so. Uh, so that is uh, a very interesting aspect in this context. Um, yes, perhaps we go on. Uh, when it comes to students with intellectual disability and migration background in special schools, uh, we have had some research already about 15 years ago, uh, my colleague Jerry Rosenquist and, and some other colleagues uh, did some research 2006-2007. Um, so uh, uh, special education in diverse Sweden, and so on, St uh, pupils with another ethnic background than Swedish in special school. And uh, I mean, that they, the reason for, for doing such kind of research is somehow the idea there could be a kind of over-representation. Otherwise, you would not even have an idea to start this kind of research. So what they did at that time, they uh, had a questionnaire. We used the questionnaire, and they found, for me, rather surprising, they found no over-representation of students of foreign uh, background. And, and perhaps I should add, at that time, we had no official statistics in this field. So therefore, this questionnaire is the only uh, source of information and, and it was a, a questionnaire that was uh, uh, conducted or research that was conducted all over Sweden. So I believe we can trust these numbers. But what we found out and what we also express in this report is that there's a great uncertainty concerning the assessment and the placement of these uh, pupils in special schools. So, um, uh, well, it's, it, is so, it is not so very clear, uh, or there has been more of a, how to say, the feeling there might be an over-representation, but they cannot, could not show it 
to summarize this report. Uh, but if you see now the latest statistics, and that is very interesting in the context of this uh, seminar we have here together today. Uh, here is the share of students with Swedish background and foreign background or migration background in special school and in primary school. You can see uh, the dark red uh, percentages, uh, so the highest number, uh, in different types of school. So on the left side we have the special school and uh, s summarizing the second and the third column here where this Grundschule and the training school. And we have also to compare these numbers uh, the primary school. So in primary school there are about 74 percent uh, children with uh, uh, that are born in Sweden with at least one parent born in Sweden, so it could be also two, of course. And if you s if we compare um, these numbers uh, on w when it comes to primary schools with a special school, we see already that there is a higher share of Swedish-born pupils uh, in primary school than in special school. And if we uh, compare these numbers also with these two different types or different different uh, d um, uh, parts of a special school. We see in the training school where children with more severe disabilities are, this tendency is even stronger. There we have uh, almost half of children uh, with that have uh, uh, parents that are born abroad or that they are, the, the children themselves are born abroad. So this is a quite high share. Uh, uh, much higher than in primary school and I think this is really something uh, what we haven't seen yet or we, what we did not really understand and reflected yet in Sweden but it's always a but so that's why I said I, I'm so confused about these numbers this seems to be quite clear but um, in the same publication of the schoolwork of the Swedish National Agency of Education uh, there are also numbers about the right to participate in mother tongue teaching. The numbers I have shown before, they are based on the population register. Uh, but here, these numbers, uh, they are based on the information, the um, uh, school work of the agent, National Agency of Education gets from the schools or gets from the teachers. And here you, we can see, well, there is a slight over-representation. Uh, there are about 29% uh, of the uh, children in uh, primary school that have the right to mother tongue education. So that means usually one hour a week or so uh, mother tongue teaching, um, compared to 33% in, in special schools. So, so there is, of course, a, a little bit, there is some difference, but it's not so, so obvious, not so clear like it was in these other numbers. And when it comes to the number of children in special schools, really get this kind of teaching so it not we can have a right but like the parents can always decide well we want that our child our daughter our son also participates or we, it's, it's voluntary we say, say well, well we don't want this and and you can see for example that the number of children who really participated in this mother tongue teaching is rather low it's about 10 percent 10 11 percent or so uh, compared to about i believe it was 59 percent when we come from primary school. So uh, that is also a very interesting uh, result or uh, interesting factor in this. So it's, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if it's really this kind of overrepresentation which we have seen before on the last slide. Uh, here I cannot find it so clear. Finally, a, a Swedish study on migration and intellectual disability that was published lately, and I have my list of references comes a little later, a uh, study of Maureen Aga, a scholar from Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And here it was the objective to investigate whether parental migration, migration parental region of origin, uh, timing of children's birth in relation to maternal migration and parental reason for migration are associated with intellectual disability with and without autism. And um, so this study is based on this uh, um, uh, cohort this, uh, from Stockholm. Uh, and what we found out 
here uh, I take out uh, I, I, I take up these conclusions only is that parental migration is associated with intellectual disability regardless of coherence of autism. Our results indicate an association between environmental factors during pregnancy related to migration and offspring intellectual disability with autism over further confirmative studies are needed. I mean, this is very much in line with the uh, uh, talks we have heard this morning already. Uh, so, but of course, this is more again the medical perspective, whereas I was more focusing on the educational perspective. Um, some, well, very preliminary conclusions. Uh, I think we have to be very careful um, when we interpret all these numbers. Uh, there's, uh, I see, a high risk for wrong interpretations, and uh, the numbers are not that clear. And when it comes to the Swedish uh, uh, debate, I also feel there's, there are a number of political implications for that. There could be a very easily misinterpretation. Uh, to, uh, you, have, you have heard about the elections we had in Sweden, that, well, we should not have so many foreigners, so we don't have so many pro uh, so much problems, so many problems in school. That could be a kind of misinterpretation, and I'm very much worried uh, uh, how such kind of results could be interpreted. Uh, so I think this is, in this meaning, it's really a hot issue. Um, when it comes to the increase of the number of students with intellectual disability from the field of education, we have a number of different pedagogical explanations. Why is there such a increase of students. And uh, in this article I have shown at the beginning uh, um, uh, my colleague uh, Daniel Östlund, he, he, he mentions a number of possible uh, uh, reasons for this increase and I'd like to summarize it here. Uh, it could be a, a kind of result uh, in the context of a curriculum reform we have had in 2011. So there's a, a tendency uh, to exclude children. Yeah, so officially there's a, this policy of inclusion, but in reality there might happen something very different. Uh, there could be economic incentives, so simply that the, uh, that the municipality has an uh, economic or financial benefit when sending children to, from one school to another. What is very important to know in Sweden, we have very much, very, very uh, clearly, we have varying local routines and perspectives. So, I have shown you this number of children uh, that are integrated in regular school. We have some municipalities where are about 20-25% of the children with intellectual disability are in regular school, but we have other municipalities, uh, uh, sometimes only some kilometers away, where nobody is integrated in regular school, where everybody is in special school. I think there are, there seems to be, how to say, there's a kind of influence, a kind of influence from local traditions. I think if you see, you may know this uh, approach from uh, uh, on uh, of street level bureaucracy, that street level bureaucrats uh, decide a lot on and have a high impact on these local routines. And finally, another idea that might be have an effect. We have a higher uh, number of children diagnosed with in the autism spectrum uh, uh, field, and this might also indirect uh, have an influence that that they there's a high uh, a tendency to more often to give diagnosis in the field of intellectual disability. When it comes to the over-representation of students with migration background in special schools, there could be different explanations. One thing I'm considering uh, from a field of education, I wonder about the social background of these children. And if you know Sweden, and you know the suburbs of Stockholm, of Gothenburg, of Malmö, and so on, there are sometimes uh, schools, I have seen schools in Malmö, for example, already 20 years ago, there has been about 97-98% of children with migration background. And um, uh, so there might be an intersection with social aspects or social class aspects and gender aspects. We have this over-representation of, of boys in special school. That is, as far as I know, all over the world. But how does it intersect with social class, for example? 
mostly these these uh, in these in these suburbs where people are living with, with uh, formerly a high, uh, not so very high education and and how does this affect how does it uh, uh, intersect with other ex aspects uh, and from a public health perspective there's this association between environmental factors during pregnancy related to migration offspring intellectual disability uh, to be honest i cannot really give a uh, answer in this field. This is simply not my field. I have to listen to what other experts in this field, in the field of medicine or public health or from a social insurance, uh, tell us about this. So there are a number of open questions, uh, and uh, uh, I believe that, first of all, that is perhaps my main result further research and mainly interdisciplinary research is needed. And I would be very happy, more than happy, if I could uh, take the opportunity here to find uh, people who are interested in this field and we could uh, further develop uh, research in this field. So, my references. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really... Uh, interesting, and we have just a few minutes for comments or questions before our next speaker. So any thoughts, anything that sprung to mind, anything you want to share? So, yes? C will bring you a microphone. Ah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I was just wondering because you said in the beginning mm -hmm. that you talked about, uh, you said it in the, turn, the change of terminology. Yes. Yes. Well, how much time do we have for that? <laughs> Uh, as I see it, it's a very long history. Mm -hmm. Whenever you develop terms in this field, um, there's a tendency that uh, people categorize of these terms get stigmatized. Mm -hmm. And you can see this tendency over 150 years or so. I could show you if, in my laptop. I have a lecture on this also. Uh, and and uh, so in the, in the 60s, the term 1960, so about 50, 60 years ago or so, the term Psychostrecklingsstörning, so intellectual, what is it, development, is it impairment, or Lisa, you're better in English than I, um, uh, was a very modern term. And also the term Sarskola, special school, came up in the 50s. And by the time these terms got a negative uh, uh, meaning, a kind of stigmatization. And there was a development uh, some years ago, and, and that I find really fascinating. First time I know it's a development uh, based on the initiatives of pupils, or former pupils on that school, that they say, no, we don't want to have this name. Uh, and uh, so there's an, uh, there has been a discussion in Sweden to change the terminology, um, and instead of Utvecklingsstörning, uh, we use nowadays more when it refers to the person, the term intellectual funktionsnedsetning, so intellectual impairment, probably, uh, or, if, and, and, uh, or functionshinder, so more of the international term disability. Uh, so that is one thing. And then when it comes to the school, uh, there will be from next year, from the summer, a, a, a new terminology. We have so far the name South Scholar, uh, and uh, from summer 2023, there will be the term uh, Anpassat Grundschola, Adapted Primary School. Um, the idea behind it is, of course, progressive, but I wonder, does the other primary school should not be adapted anymore? Yeah, so I also wrote about this. I, find, I see this change of terminology quite critical and, and I mean I have also in my dissertation I took up these developments in Sweden in, in the interwar period and so on. So I know 
quite well this very long historical development. And every now and then, every 15 or 20 years, there's a tendency uh, to or strive to change the terminology. And I'm very much sure. Uh, I'm very sure that we will have in perhaps 15 or 20 years again uh, a, d uh, a discussion that uh, the term adapted uh, will have a negative touch. Yeah, you go to the adapted school. Wow. So, so I think that is a very problematic, and I, we have to see 150 years or 200 years of development in this context. Mm -hmm. Hi. Do you have a spot for every children that want to go to special school, or do you have to pick them out? And do you have special schools all over the country? Mm -hmm. When we use the word the term special school, uh, this could, can, be, can look very different in different places. Uh, and uh, as I see it, it's very often a quite pragmatic approach. Um, very often these special schools are special classes under the roof of a primary school because the more rural it is, the more difficult or the more expensive it would be to have a school funded or, or organized on their own. So that is somehow more flexible. But um, we know very little about the cooperation between special school and regular school. There are some schools, and I mean, I've seen such schools, there is cooperation, uh, but there are also other schools where there's very little cooperation. And this can vary very much. So, so you may correct me, Lisa, then in your discussion. Uh, I know very little research is really taking in detail into this relation between general education and special education and how we cooperate. Uh, also in this field, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of research would be needed. Is this an answer to your question? Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, uh, we have a lot of children that would be um, considered to be in training school uh, mm -hmm. that don't get the spots, that we have maybe mm -hmm. five or seven or 15 kids that would need that kind of support but don't get in. So that's why she was asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you also have to see the local conditions. As far I've been twice in Iceland, once <coughs> as a tourist some 20 years ago and, and once on a conference some years ago. And, and when I'm, for example, in, let's say, in Akureyri, or even more rural area, it's, of course, I mean, it's, it has to do with accessibility. Uh, and, and, and it's the enormous distance and so on. When we hear the, your talk uh, showing us that... that uh, uh, your center is responsible for all uh, for whole Iceland. Uh, what is if you see just the area? I don't know exactly now uh, uh, the numbers you have shown us, but but it's a rather big area. So it, yeah, so it takes quite a long time to get there, and you cannot go every day to to uh, to school then uh, without having a home or whatever. Uh, so so of course these ge geography uh, geograph uh, conditions. Uh, we have, of course, an impact in this field. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi. Are there schools where children stay overnight, or are, are there no such? Uh, I believe there are some are left, but not very many. Uh, some very few are left. I mean, there has been a change, uh, if you see the last, let's say, 100 years, until the 50s, 60s or so, it was very clear when the child has an intellectual disability, the best place is uh, an institution and start. But this has changed from the 1960s, influenced by the concept of normalization, Bengnerius work, the con uh, influenced by the concept of uh, the principle of small groups. Karl Grunewald, he was one of the uh, 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 people who promoted this system. And uh, from the 80s or so, or 90s, we have not we do not have these kind of big institutions anymore. So um, uh, there are some very few places where also for, for a specific time the children can stay, uh, but uh, uh, we don't have such kind of big institutions anymore. Yes, so thank you. <coughs> <coughs>
Thank you ever so much. And it's nice that we have all warmed up for questions and we will continue with this lively discussion after lunch. But now for our last speaker uh, before lunch, it's researcher Pilvikki Heinonen from the Finnish Association of Intellectual and De Developmental Disabilities. Pilvikki will present us with the results that uh, she and Maria Holm from the Finnish Institute of Health and Welfare found regarding well-being uh, among immigrants with disabilities during COVID-19. Their research had a larger interest and didn't only focus on children and youth, but all ages. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Aslak. Good day, it's wonderful to be here today and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about our project. As you heard, my topic is there, it's well-being among immigrants with disability during the COVID-19 and it's quite exactly like that, that it's not only the, only the children, but it's the whole is this working? <laughs> yeah, it's working all right. So my name is Pilvikki Heinonen. I come from Kehitysvammaliitto, from Finnish Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And I'm here to represent our whole project. It's a whole group of people working around this topic. I have done this, sli this slideshow together with Maria Holm. And um, she is a statistical researcher, PhD from uh, Finnish Institute for health and welfare. She could unfortunately not come here today, but I have her greetings here and you can reach her via email if you have specific questions. This is the contents, what I will go through today. I will shortly, very shortly, with two slides, introduce our project to you. Then we will have a peek into Maria's study. That's a population-based study on adolescents in Finland. And she has chosen some graphs that she thought might especially interest you here today. And then we will have a look at some results of interviews of people of migrant origin and with disability. That is work that I have been doing. <laughs> Good. So our project is called Building the Future. It started last year, it's been running this year and it's still going to continue next year. It is funded by the European Social Funding, ESR in Finnish, I think it's ESF in English. And our goal is to support persons with disabilities and persons of migrant origin in their coping skills and ability to function in the ongoing COVID-19 crisis and also other corresponding exceptional situations and crises. What this means is that we examine both persons with disabilities and persons with migrant origin and how they have experienced the coronavirus crisis. And then we also have another objective to consider people who belong to both minorities. So they are now persons with migrant origin and they have disabilities. And that is what I will talk to you about today. It is a cooperative effort. There is uh, for the Finnish-speaking listeners, it's Kehitysvammaliitto, THL and Kuntaliitto. And here are the English names, they are somewhat longer. It's the <laughs> Finnish Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, where I come from. It's Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, that's where Maria is from. And then there's Association of Finnish Local and Regional Authorities working with us as well. And what are we then doing in our project? It's a group of people working together on this team. First of all, we are doing research. We provide information on challenges that have emerged in everyday lives and services of persons with disabilities and persons of migrant origin during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, we look at it from the perspective of the persons themselves, but also from the perspective of, of the services and service providers and organizers. Then we don't only provide information and do research, we also develop instructions 
operating methods and networks dealing with emergencies and crisis situations at the municipal level. And the idea, of course, is to be better prepared for the crisis in future, to <coughs> learn from, from the COVID-19 crisis. Our work is still in progress, so I can't give you instructions at the end that this, this, this and this is done and then everything goes well. But I will show where we are at the moment and then we can discuss about that. Now we have Maria's greetings here. Maria is working on a population-based study on adolescents in Finland. That is a kouluterveyskysely, school health promotion study. It is a study that it is a questionnaire that's given during the school day to all students at school on 8th and ninth grade. This means there's the number, it's over 91,000 children in this group. They are 14, 15 and 16 year old. The average age was a little bit over 15. And uh, because it's given, it's a questionnaire given at school, and then they can, during the school day, answer it. It's, it has an exceptionally high percentage of answers. It's as high as 95%. So there's over 87,000 answers to this. It's an excellent set of data. There, there are some definitions, what we mean with disability, and who is an immigrant. The definition of disability follows the UNICEF and Washington group definition. It is asked from the adolescents themselves, and there have been some answers that we, we have, or Maria has noticed that they can't be true, so she has taken those out, but otherwise, otherwise we trust their own, own answers. They have answered that they have either a lot of difficulty or cannot do at all, at least in one of the following functions. Seeing, hearing, walking, self-caring, speaking understandable, learning things, remembering things, concentrating, accepting changes, controlling behavior, and making friends. So those who are in these crafts, called disabled, they have answered themselves that they have a lot of difficulty or cannot do at all, at least in one of these categories. And then who is an immigrant? It's an adolescent who has told that their parents were born abroad. And this might mean one parent if the other parent is unknown, or it might mean both parents, but all known parents have been born abroad. Here are the prevalences of the adolescents with disability. Uh, there's a typing mistake in the numbers, we will correct it to the, the slide set that you will get, but uh, the per percentages are right. And I have different colors in it because it's the same colors that go with these exact groups in the following graphs. The green color here <coughs> indicates the immigrant background. It's six per percentage of all, all the adolescents who have answered this questionnaire. They have an immigrant background. And a little bit less than half of them uh, have a disability of some kind. And a uh, little bit over half of them don't have a disability. It's three percentage of the whole whole group, but still it's, it's over 2,000 and the other one, other group is nearly 3,000 answers. It's, it's quite, a, quite a good amount of answers anyway. Then there's 35% of other adolescents, meaning not having an immigrant background, who have a disability. And then 59% of other adolescents who don't have a disability just to know how big the groups are behind the answers. And then we look at Maria's results. Maria has found out that the immigrants with disability have more often reported a lot of worries about COVID-19 in this school health promotion questionnaire in 2021. There have been three statements uh, that they have answered that they have a lot of worry about. It's the first one is someone close to you getting infected with coronavirus. The second one is that you are worried that you may infect yourself, other people. And then the last one is that they have been worried about getting infected themselves with coronavirus. And in all of these three statements, it's the same group has, that has the biggest amount 
of answers telling that they have a lot of worry, and it's always the immigrants with disability. We can see that also the immigrant background and not having a disability and having a disability but not immigrant background, they also have a little bit higher, higher percentage. And then the adolescents without disability, they have the lowest number on having a lot of worry about different things about COVID-19. So it has been a worrying time for the adolescents with immigrant background and disabilities. Then we have this following graphs. Adolescents with disability reported increased disagreements and conflicts inside family, whether or not they were immigrants. Here it seems that the having a disability is the thing that was connected to increased disagreements and conflicts. It wasn't so much the immigrant background. And then decreased amount of time we spent with family there was again a significant difference. The adolescents with immigrant background and, and uh, disabilities, 20% of them have reported decreased time spent with family. It's lower percentage with, with the other adolescents. And then this is the last graph set from Maria. Interestingly, the, the adolescents with migrant background, they informed that they had less decreased keeping in touch with grandparents compared to the other adolescents in Finland. Of course, their grandparents might be further away, so maybe it didn't affect them much. But this is a graph where it's the other way around than in the other ones. And then decreased keeping in touch with friends, there actually wasn't that big difference. It's again the adolescents with migrant background and disabilities who have the highest number there, but the differences aren't that big. It's 36% against 32 and 33. So these are findings from Maria's work. It's still an ongoing work, so there's, there's like a little peek into it. And Maria is happy to get connection and answer any questions if you have. Then, I, then we have a look into interviews. This is something we've been doing at Finnish Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. We've interviewed 10 persons of migrant origin and having a disability or disabled children. The interviews have been planned and done by Sonia Miettinen, who is our Deputy Research Director Doctor of Social Sciences, and I have been analyzing the interviews. That's my work in this project. Seven of the respondents themselves had a disability of some kind, and three of the respondents were parents of children with disabilities. And now Aslaug asked that I would try to take the parents of children with disabilities here in special highlight, and that's what I have done. But of course, it's only three interviews. We have to keep that in mind. The respondents had a very heterogeneous background. They, the variation in education, working status, language, age, disabilities, it was amazing. And I think that is also something that gives, even though it's only 10 interviews, but it probably gives quite a good picture of this group. We can't talk about immigrants having disabilities as one, one bunch because they have a whole different kind of stories behind them it was fascinating. And also their country of origin was varying, but I have to say that in this group of 10 interviews, the biggest group was the culture area North Africa and Middle East, including Iran and Afghanistan. It is not the biggest um, group of immigrants in Finland, but in this 10 interviews it came came up. I don't know how it is with families with disabled children, what are the backgrounds of those, I can't comment on that. But this is our 10 interviews. And now I have two slides left. I have five points to 
highlight from these interviews that I have been analyzing. First of all, it's a positive thing to hear that all the respondents felt that they had been very well informed about COVID-19. There was not a single one who would have said that I didn't get enough information. They all had heard enough of COVID-19 virus and how to protect yourself from it and to use the mask and disinfect your hands. And even though there was a parent who had difficulties reading themselves, also that parent had got plenty of information. That was not a problem at all. And the parents of children with disability, they got information quite well also from school and daycare. Of course, they also heard it from other places, the radio, the television, other social contacts they had, but also school and daycare took care of that. But then where the information was not the problem, but where the problem was, was then the delays and cancellations of healthcare and social services. This comes now close to Anna Mar Marie's um, talk, what you talked about. All of them reported some kind of delays or cancellations that they had. There was uh, maybe the child had a flu or the person at the healthcare had a flu or whatever, but there, there was a lot of cancellations. And children with disability, they had been meeting their therapists a lot less regularly due to cancellations. Sometimes the cancellation was because of the family, sometimes because of the therapist. And there was also a time when, when it was uh, like they, they weren't meeting. You said that they had like from distance therapies that, that wasn't that didn't come up in interviews, but but they, the, somebody said there that they were like cancelled for a while altogether, and there was even one story about a cancelled doctor appointment, but this doctor appointment was meant to be uh, for the needs assessment for the therapy and as Anna-Marie Anna showed the, how the process works in Finland you have to go to the doctor and you have to have the needs assess assessment and then you have to have your papers written that you can apply for the therapy. So if a child is in this situation that doesn't have the therapy yet but needs it and then the doctor <laughs> appointment is delayed then it means that the needs ass assessment is not done and also you can't get to the therapy. And the parents also told that the therapies had impact on everyday life. The children were not going to the speech therapist, the occupational therapist, just for fun. It was for very good reasons. And now they didn't get this support in their life during this time. And then, unfortunately, it wasn't only the, the cancelled or delayed meetings, but also in cases of needing new support or help, help, it was very difficult to reach. Applying for services seemed difficult. It is also in previous papers seen that um, with migrant background, applying for services is experienced difficult here, but it sounded like in during COVID-19 crisis, it was even more difficult than normally. New appointments to healthcare services were hard to get and personal assistance was also hard to find if, if you needed a new one. What the interviewed parents, now the three parents in this interviewed group told, what kind of unmet needs they had, they were dental care, help at home and mental support, especially when having the COVID virus in the family. The dental care situation was a family where the child had serious dental issues and needed a surgery. And they had lived in another municipality in Finland and that municipality had always, or already said that, oh yes, we take care of that and the child needs a surgery and we pay for that and no problem. But then they moved to another area in Finland and suddenly it wasn't all right anymore. The new municipality said that no, we're not going to pay for that. You, you can have a surgery, but you have to pay it for yourself. And the price was 3,000 euro, which was for this family impossible. So that sounded like, from this story, as, the, uh, as it was told in interview, it sounded like that was also connected to the COVID crisis, not having time, not having money. But of course, you can't know what was behind the decision. Then there was um, also stories about needing help at home when being ill with COVID. And um, there, I think, it sounded like 
their parents didn't even know where they could possibly contact. There was a family who was in real trouble, having children with special needs and then being really ill, and they said that they would have expected to get some help home, but uh, they actually didn't call anywhere. They didn't let anybody know, so nobody could come. But I think that they also didn't know who they could ask for. They felt that nobody will anyway come and nobody wants to come here while we're so ill. Also mental support was failed. There was a parent who was even at hospital and was taken care of because of COVID. But um, they told that they didn't get mental support needed. They tried to talk to a nurse or needed to talk to someone, but it wasn't possible. And then what I found really interesting and actually quite important and connected to children as well is that all the parents mentioned the language courses. Here it's only three parents, but this is something that has been coming up also in interviews before. It's not a new thing. And it sounded like these parents of children with disabilities had serious difficulty in attending language courses and sounded like they are very inflexible structures in our language courses. They because they are parents of children with special needs, they needed to be away from the language lessons because of the therapies or because of taking care of the child's needs. And then the language teacher didn't necessarily understand that. They were saying that, hey, look, you've been missing lessons. If you can't come here, then goodbye. We'll give you a place to the next one in the queue. And one parent told a story that the teacher wanted to see a piece of paper stating that she's been at the therapy with the child, but then the therapist couldn't write a piece of paper because it's not a sick leave, it's just a therapy session. And then she was in between, like needing a paper to the language teacher, but not getting it from the therapist and like her word not being enough. And that sounds like <laughs> there's something we need to change. And that's now the parents, that's not directly the children, but um, I'm a so social scientist and that's my, that's my background. And I think that one part, one very important part of when we think about the child's well-being is also that we have to take care of the whole family and the whole family situation. If the parents don't get to their language courses and they don't learn Finnish or it's very badly delayed, they probably don't get employed and that affects the whole situation of the family in the future and also the children in the family. These were my five points about the interviews and that's my last slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, thank you. We have some minutes before lunch. <laughs> so do you have some thoughts and Question, something you would like to comment on? Yeah? Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm interested in uh, knowing a little bit more about uh, the participants with uh, disabilities. How was their capacity to answer the, the questionnaire and to participate in the interview? How reliable were their answers, or did they need any special, uh, like, rewording, or...? Yeah, so. that's a very good question. Unfortunately, I'm not able to answer for the school health promotion questionnaire. I don't know how it's... that's Maria's part. I don't know how that's done in it, if they have help in that or not, or if it's in different languages. I don't have the knowledge, but with the interviews, I can answer. They, as said, they had very different kind of backgrounds, and some of the respondents had lived already quite many years in Finland, and they actually spoke Finnish. So part of the interviews were done in Finnish, so that they, the persons with migrant background answered in Finnish themselves. But then part of the interviews were done with an interpreter. And I, I do, I have to, I, I wasn't there, I haven't done the interviews, I've only been analysing them, but from seeing what has been said and analysing it, I have also the feeling that the interpreter has affected it. Maybe everything didn't go through or maybe not all the answers came back or... But it was not, this interview part was not a questionnaire, it was a interview with some, some team questions. Yes. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes. 
Anna. Yep, I'm Laura. coming with the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. It's been really interesting to listen to to your presentation. I'm just wondering, um, one of the problems that uh, parents called our organization mostly about was um, because kids couldn't go to school and then obviously the parents couldn't go to work. Mm. And there were some like compensation to families who were in that position by the government, uh, but not if they were over the age of 18. And you know, for, for many children with disabilities, especially intellectual disabilities, it doesn't matter if you're 19 or 16, you, know, you, you still can't be on your own. Mm. And I'm just wondering, I mean, did this never come up? And, and we had the feeling, we don't have any research or interviews or nothing, um, that it was even harder for families with immigrant background uh, because at least like the others have like a social network of grandparents or friends or whatever. I'm just curious, did this never come up in the interview? You know, about th this challenge yeah. of not being able to go anywhere. Yeah, that's a very important point and uh, has to be taken in consideration, I think, as well. It did not come up in these interviews, but we have to remember this is only 10 interviews and seven of those were persons with having disabilities themselves and it was only three parents with disabled children and they were all either in like daycare or in school age. So this case didn't come up. Can I follow up on the question? Uh, and I was wondering if um, any of, of the things that came up in the interview had to do with um, loneliness or uh, being yeah. socially isolated and how, how uh, were the responses in this group? That did come up. There were, n not, not in all of the, there were some who had quite an active social life, but I would say the majority was suffering from being lonely. And that was, that was not now in the group of the parents, but it was from the seven other interviews that one unmet need was also the need to finding contact to people and finding contact to Finnish, Finnish people. They, th there was a lot of loneliness. Yes, and other questions or thoughts? No? Yeah? Is it? Were you, or are you just <laughs> fixing your hair? <laughs> That's You're on good the too. spot now. <laughs> so but if I can still add, yes, we, this is now, as I said in the beginning, it's not just my work. There's a whole big group of people working on this project in in these three different organizations and we are very, very interested in also making new contacts and hearing how you deal with these kind of topics. Thank you. Thank you. So we are nearing the end of this first part and uh, I would like to use the opportunity to thank you all for your in important contributions, insights and discussions. And it has been a delight to listen and learn and connect and share. And I for one hope that this in-person and online meeting will lead to a deeper understanding and knowledge sharing on the topic for the future. Uh, after lunch, uh, uh, we will continue at 12.30 uh, with a panel discussion led by Kaisa Kepsu from the Nordic Welfare Center. You already know that. Uh, and we have uh, Mahmoud Hassan, a service advisor at the Support Center for Immigrants uh, with disabilities in Filma, called Hilma for short, and Mariut uh, Virsu, a special needs teacher and a doctoral researcher at Tampere University, Lise Roll Pettersson, professor of special education at Stockholm University, and Inkolvur Einarsson, MD and developmental pediatrician at the Counseling and Diagnostic Center in Iceland was here in the very beginning. So we start like we end. Uh, we are saying goodbye to those of you who followed us online. Thank you very much. 
the streamed material will be accessible at the website integrationnorden.org or you can go to the Nordic Welfare uh, Center's homepage to access it or find information about the streamed material. Uh, that will be in a few weeks when we have had time or they've had time to edit it. Uh, so we say farewell to you online and we say bon appetit for you here in Helsinki. Thank you. <laughs>